Hi everyone, I'm Scott Brandley. And I'm Alicia Coakley. Every member of the church has a story to share, one that can instill faith, invite growth, and inspire others. On today's episode, we're going to hear how a battle with mental health, an answer to a call, and a desire to endure helped one young lady develop a relationship with a Savior she never thought possible. Welcome to Latter-day Lights. Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Latter-day Lights. We're so excited that you're here with us and that you are part of this community and that you're here to listen to this amazing story that we have for you today. So we're in for a a real treat today. It's actually my daughter, Clarissa. She's my oldest. Yay! (laughs) We're so excited to have her. Mm -hmm. So um, Clarissa, how are you doing today? Doing really good, actually. I had an awesome day. Good. I'm so glad to hear. That's amazing. (laughs) So for those out there watching, Clarissa is single. I am taking applications for dating her because my approval is more important than Scott's. No. (laughs) Oh, Clarissa was actually in Young Women's when I was um, in the young women's presidency and stuff. So I got to build a really awesome relationship with her back in Ogden. And she's just like one of my favorite people in the whole, whole wide world. And I love her and she's a brilliant artist and she's super sweet and kind. And I just love her. She's awesome. So I'm super excited for you to be here. I'm excited to hear your story and to have you, you know, share. And for our listeners, um, Clarissa is actually a very big reason why this podcast exists, right? right. (laughs) She is. So when, um, when Clarissa is just getting off of her mission, she uh, had her parents drive from Utah through Elko to California to go pick her up. And when they were coming back through, they thought it would be nice to stop and to say hello and to visit me. And I was able to go to breakfast with them. And that's when we just kind of got into this conversation about how I was writing a book and I'm going to this book conference and Scott's like, I wrote a book and we're like, what? And anyway, it just propelled everything. Scott ended up going to the conference by himself because I got sick. And if you guys want the whole story, you can go listen to our first episode. But if it hadn't been for Clarissa's serving in California, we would never have had that breakfast and it never would have happened. So kudos to you. Thanks, Clarissa. You're the best. Oh, you're welcome for me having way too much stuff to bring home on a plane. So I had to have my parents come get me. I had a plant, this gorgeous potted plant. I couldn't leave it there. I still have it. No, of course it's doing not. Great. That's amazing. So I, I kill plants and fish, but not kids or pets. So those are the important ones. <laughs> I guess so. All right, Clarissa, tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. I feel like I got an awesome introduction already. Like, Alicia, you're also one of my favorite people. I I love that you do this podcast now because now I talk to you way more often over the phone. It's really nice. Right? (laughs) I love you so much. Um, I love you. Hi, my name is Clarissa. I've been home for my mission for like a year now. I served in Sacramento, California. Best mission ever. It was amazing. Um, I would do it all over again, like 10 times. It was amazing. I just, awesome. I'm going to talk more about it. Y'all are going to hear, but um, I am an artist professionally. I am trying to start a YouTube channel. That turns out to be really hard. So prayers would be appreciated. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm kind of boring. That's all I got. Not boring at all. I don't think so. <laughs> nice try awesome. though. And Clarissa, she does a lot of behind the scenes work on our episode. She does a lot of editing and everything like that and helps us with all of our technology. So not only is she beautiful and super talented when it comes to all the artsy fartsy stuff, but she has a big old technology brain that she can figure things out with too. So see, she is definitely like an 11 teen cow woman. (laughs) Wow, yeah, that's the best compliment exactly. I've ever gotten. I'm telling you. <laughs> wow. I'm going to put that All on my right. mutual profile, I hope you realize. I think you should. I think that you're going to get a lot of activity now. So, And you know, at this book conference, I actually met a woman 
who this this time around that I just went to, I met a woman whose son created the LDS Mingles app. Oh, okay, okay. I, I got some I got some real connections going on here. So look at you go. <laughs> All right. Well, Miss Clarissa, the floor is yours. Why don't you tell us where your story begins? Well, my story kind of centers around my mental health and how I was able to overcome my challenges there. But I started realizing that I had symptoms of anxiety like all the way maybe in middle school, like at least really early high school. And it was really difficult for me at the time because it was very overwhelming. I felt kind of like I had a fire alarm going off inside my head, like all the time, just constant panic. And I didn't have the, the... words to be able to communicate what I was feeling. And I just figured if I ignored it long enough, it would go away, which I don't think that's ever solved the problem ever. No, nope. (laughs) Um, So it got worse and worse until I just really lost all will to keep going. It was so hard to trudge through every single day. And I was had, I had so much pain, like a physical pain inside my chest, like constantly. Mm. And it just got to the point where I I didn't want to live anymore. It was so painful just to exist. Um, and I remember I, because it was, I, it, I was feeling so dark and it was like the, my thoughts inside my head were so loud and so negative. I couldn't feel the gentle and, and sweet and soft um, promptings from the spirit. And I just couldn't feel that. Mm-hmm. And so it had been a long time since I had prayed. I just got to a point where I was desperate. There was my last ditch. It was either like, God help me or I end my life. So I prayed and I asked, asked God to heal me. And he didn't. (laughs) Then he instead helped me have just enough strength to keep going. He told me, well, I don't know if he told me in words per se. I can't remember specifically, but I had this distinct feeling that I wasn't allowed to die. I know that sounds kind of weird, but that that wasn't the answer. It wasn't going to solve my problems. It was just going, if anything, I was going to be stuck with my pain without a body to do anything about it. Hmm. Um, and I, I, at least for me, I knew that that's, I needed to live and I needed to continue, uh, but I didn't know why. And I didn't have any sign that it was going to get better. So I kept living and eventually I started to work on my like mental self-talk. I started to be more positive, especially toward myself and, and allow myself to feel okay about things. And it kind of got a little bit better, like to a bearable point. Um, But I was having daily panic attacks for years. It was awful, Mm. (laughs) especially to go through high school like that. It was just, yeah, it was, I'd rather, I'd rather eat my left foot than do that again. (laughs) And how old were you when you first started having these thoughts of like wanting to end your life? Do you remember? I can't remember um, specifically. I could have been 14. Wow. Something around there. But that's not fun for any age. And no one Mm -hmm. really talked about it back then. And so I just didn't know what to do with those feelings. But yeah. Now I have lots more knowledge now. And you never well, shared any of this with your no. family, right? Oh, they didn't absolutely know. Absolutely not. I thought mm-hmm. I was crazy. I didn't want anyone else to think I was crazy. We yeah. had no idea. We thought she was just fine. She yeah. she held she kept it hidden really well. Thanks, wow. I tried. <laughs> oh, that was a bad thing. <laughs> so you're in high school and and you're starting to get a little bit better, a little more bearable. Right. Um, What else happened from there? I kind of developed, I didn't have any coping mechanisms to deal with this. I kind of started living my life in this like feast and famine, this really intense swings where I would, I wasn't letting my anxiety control my life. I was in control of my life. So I would decide I'm going to school. I'm giving this presentation. I'm going to talk to new people. I'm going to go be in this crowd. Things that were really hard for me. I would make myself do them. The cost of that was just feeling exceedingly terrible for like days. So I would go do an event and then I would stay home for days and like recover Mm. from that and then do it again over and over again. Obviously that's not helpful or healthy. 
but it was how I like survived. Mm -hmm. And that worked until I got the prompting that I needed to go on a mission. And this was not like any um, spiritual revelation I had received up to this point. And it was difficult for me to feel the spirit in general. So this really stood out. I, I, in no uncertain terms, God told me I had to go on a mission. So I was like, what am I going to do? Say no. So (laughs) I put in my papers and I got called to Sacramento, California, and I left. I had no um, delusions thinking I was going to be able to stay out. Like, I, I knew how bad it really was, and nobody else did. So I just thought, like, I'll do my best. God wanted me to serve. I'll serve for as long as I can, and I'll probably get sent home early. I'll just, I'll see how long I can make it, uh, which is, like, a, it was an interesting mindset, but it was fine. Mm-hmm. But... I got uh, I got a promise in the MTC from my STL who was over me at the time. Um, she gave me a missionary promise. We were all practicing those at the time. She gave me a missionary promise that I would serve um, a full 18 months, which wow. I was pretty surprised that she would be willing to say it, but I felt the spirit confirm it. So I was like, we'll see how that happens. Good luck. Yeah. Uh, so I went on my mission and... I had an amazing trainer. She is fantastic. She actually just had a baby like on Friday. Aww. It's the cutest thing in the whole world. I Aww. tried to convince her to name it after me, but it didn't. Next kid, <laughs> next kid. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she was just amazing. She supported me in everything that I did. And she listened to me. And we were around each other literally 24 seven. And so I couldn't hide. I couldn't do this up and down um, garbage that I was trying to get away with. I couldn't go out and teach and then come home and crash. I just had to continue to stay a missionary the whole time. Mm -hmm. And so eventually, obviously, she realized that I was broken and she had me talk to her about it. And that was the first time I had really ever explained it in full. And no matter how crazy I sounded, no matter how um, out of control I seemed, She just loved me and she supported me. And that was wonderful. Um, So can I ask real quick, what was that first conversation like? Like, how did she get you to open up? You know, was, I mean, was there anything that she said that kind of made you feel like it was okay to share or did she, it was just a little bit at a time or. She is the nosiest person I've ever met. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so funny she's excellent at facebook stalking if she wants to know something she will find out <laughs> and so it wasn't really like it was almost like i didn't really have a choice in the matter she was going to find out either way and so like it was just a, it's a matter of time but okay. i think the most um memorable conversation i can remember specifically is i had just gotten my first plants in california and i was repotting them and she was like recommending a talk to me. So we were listening to it while we were repotting these plants. Because um, mm-hmm. that's what missionaries do in their free time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it was about mental health. And it was the first time I'd ever heard mental health talked about in a church light. And it blew my mind. It was insane. I think I started crying. And she was wow. like, tell me about it. But do you just, remember what this talk was? Ooh, I have a list. We'll put it in the description. We'll put it in the description. There you go. It's okay, on a sticky perfect. note that's around here. Somewhere. <laughs> okay. But it was okay. an excellent talk. I actually have a uh, collection of talks now that were really oh, helpful awesome. for my mental health. And I would love to share those with anyone. Okay. We'll take I them all. Those. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> um, she was wonderful. And I 100% could not have served a full mission without her. Because... I, there was just a certain amount that I could handle. And then I reached my limit and I plummeted. Like I had never felt so happy as I had felt on my mission, but my anxiety and all of my bad mental health habits for years and years and years, they were going to catch up to me. And so they hit like right at the end of my training. And Mm -hmm. I had, I can only describe it as like a mental breakdown. Like it was awful. I had never felt so terrible in my whole life and I couldn't, it was almost like I couldn't 
think I definitely couldn't talk. I did not talk for several days. And wow. I just, I hurt so badly inside. I thought my heart was just going to stop just like of its own, mm-hmm. like on its own. Like I just physically could not handle the pressure inside of me. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I can remember walking in Walmart, like pushing the cart. Cause it was like, I was literally a zombie. And that was the only thing I was capable of doing. Just like one more step, one more step. And I kept thinking that I was just going to like die there in the aisle of Walmart, just spontaneously. Wow. Just like, it was awful. Um, but she loved me enough to like, even though I, I begged her never to, um, tell president how bad I was feeling, which is obviously not a good thing. You should tell your mission president how you're feeling. Um, but I just wanted him to think I was a good missionary and I was a little bit deluded into thinking that I could lie to him, (laughs) but she loved me enough to, um, endanger our friendship to get me help. And so she called president against my will and she arranged to have me meet with the mission therapist. And I love her so much for that because she, she changed my life. She saved my life. Hmm. Sorry. Got me all teary eyed. I love so much what you just said that she was willing to endanger your friendship. Cause I think that that's something that's so scary, especially for, you know, people who are younger, you know, um, and it just, it resonates so close to me because I, I don't know if you know this, but one of my kiddos, my middle kiddo, um, was having a tough time with having some thoughts of hurting himself, um, at the end of last year. And one of his friends, you know, was able to reach out to me too, knowing that it would, it would put a big wedge in their relationship, you know? Um, but she cared enough for him as a friend to reach out to me and, and, and they really aren't, they really aren't friends anymore the way that they used to be, you know, it's definitely been something like that, but I'm so thankful to her as a parent because I was able to get the help that, that he needed, you know? So that's, that's amazing. I, I love that she did that and that she was brave enough to do that. So. Yeah. That was really a turning point for me. Like it, I, I knew it was really bad. I knew my mental health was complete trash, but I was not ready to actually face how truly bad it was. I was still lying to myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't until I was forced to meet with the therapist that I finally was like, yeah, I've needed a therapist for a long time. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. um, And I don't know how much like the therapist himself like actually helped more that my willingness to actually meet with one helped a lot. And I got Mm -hmm. several promised blessings from my STLs and I got some blessings and I just finally like faced it head on instead. Cause I felt like it was like this monster, like lurking in the background. I saw like out of the corner of my eye the whole time I've been avoiding it, but I finally just like turned and looked it right in the eyes and it was ugly, but it couldn't run. You know, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then I, I can remember a moment where I was, I had changed areas at this point, which is really good. I needed a new start. I needed like a place to heal. Um, Mm -hmm. And I can remember kneeling in my apartment, like right after personal study. And I, we were supposed to pick an area to improve, I think. And I had like three options that I thought would be really awesome places for me to like grow and improve. And one of them was mental health, but I only put that there because I felt like I had to, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Cause I didn't actually believe that my mental health could improve. Like I just felt so terrible. And when you're feeling like that, your thoughts are so clouded and Mm -hmm. I just could not see clearly. And what does Satan want you to do? Feel terrible. He's not going to want you to believe you can get better. So I didn't actually Mm -hmm. like think that was an option. And I can remember praying and asking God, which are the ones he wanted me to improve on. And I remember like, I, once again, I can't remember if it was words or if it was just the most distinct feeling, but I knew it was God's will that I heal. This was mind boggling to me. Absolutely revolution. Like, what do you mean get better? I can't get better. (laughs) This is my cross I'm supposed to carry. Like, I'm just, I'm not meant to be happy. I'm supposed to make other people happy. I've already figured this out. Like I made up a purpose for myself. (laughs) And I was like, I just could not comprehend it. But if it's God's will, like, who am I to tell him like, no, (laughs) 
Yeah. So I realized for the first time that I had to get better. So I s- didn't really know where to start. I was meeting with the therapist. I did not like him. <laughs> <laughs> mainly because he represented to me how broken I was and I, I feel kind of bad for him because you know I, that was his job but yeah um so I just took one step I just tried and so I started reading scriptures on mental health I started reading talks on mental health intentionally and not fed to me by my trainer I um I started studying and preach my gospel there's a really awesome book called adjusting to missionary life that I think should be relabeled adjusting to life it's got fantastic (laughs) tips in there um and i started studying that and then i found there's a whole section in the gospel library about mental health and about like life challenges in general that thing is fantastic you can read it forever there's like links to links to links to links to things you'll never you'll never get to it all and i also found something that i feel like was really um important to me at the time was the church's emotional self-reliance um booklet you're like Mm -hmm. supposed to do it with a group but i was a missionary and i didn't have a group so i just read the manual and watched like the associated videos yeah and just like the little things in it helped me change my thinking and i started learning coping mechanisms that were healthy for me and i started to learn how to process and manage my emotions instead of like shove them away and be like that'll that won't come back and bite me later you know yeah (laughs) I started to understand like why I would do certain things like when I was really overwhelmed I just would like hide in the bathroom with the lights off and like sit in the tub and I would like at the time I'm like why am I doing this I'm crazy this is insane and then I realized oh I am overstimulated right now there's too many sensory input things I gotta limit it and that's why I was doing what I was doing. And then once I had an understanding of what was happening to me, I was able to understand what I could do to make it better. And you know what made me right. really annoyed? <laughs> Wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I was suffering yeah. for a long time just because I needed a snack sometimes, you know? like Yeah, yeah. I needed a snack. I needed more sleep. I needed to allow myself to take rest. I needed Mm -hmm. to listen to my body and what was telling me. If I'm starting to feel anxious, that's actually like a, that's like the check engine light on your car. Like I should pay attention to that and acknowledge it and maybe find some things to help instead of just like, I'm fine all the time. That is not good for you. Right. But I slowly started to heal and I started to grow. And I realized that looking back, I could see God's hand in my garbage mental health the entire time like he first saved my life and then he preserved me he gave me enough strength to continue on until i finally wised up enough to ask him to heal me and then he did slowly not like all at once like ta-da magical miracle cure but like i needed every single moment of both the struggling and the healing to result in this final person that i became that was whole Like, I don't know how to explain the feeling, but I had never, like for years and years and years, I just felt, I just felt like a hole inside. Like I felt wrong and empty and broken for so long. And after I came to know Christ and I came to know my savior and I let him, well, I let myself fall apart and then I let him put me back together. I, for the first time, felt joy and I felt or holy I just I am a new person I'm 100% a different person than I was before and it never it wasn't temporary I was terrified that it would just like happen and it would leave I have felt like this since like this just inner feeling of of contentment and knowing that no matter what happens I am a new person and God gave me a new song to sing it's I can't ever like deny it. I owe everything I am to him. And I'm so glad I was on a mission when this happened because I was surrounded in Christ. (laughs) Every minute of my life was centered on Christ. And so when I was broken and I needed a place to go to heal, I didn't go to the internet. I didn't go to YouTube. I didn't go to WebMD. I went to Christ and that's what actually healed me. Wow. So, so for our listeners, this mission of yours all happened during COVID, yeah. which 
it was not a regular mission. So that was something else that you kind of had to deal with. But in your case, I remember you telling me that it was almost kind of like a blessing in disguise, you know, that, that there were times where you just had to stay inside, right? Yeah. And you couldn't go out and just door knock. You had to like find people to teach through virtual teaching. Right. Um, and I think that that's so neat because it's like, even in the face of something so big and scary and horrible for the entire world, you know, there was something that could still bring you some peace there. And heavenly father, he was very aware of every single person, you know, and he knew that that could be something that could throw you even further into a tailspin. But because of the way that everything worked out, it, it actually kind of helped you. Correct. Yeah. I was one of the only missionaries, like not one of the only, but there was a small select few that actually served their full missions during that time which made mm-hmm. that promise blessing they received even more crazy. Right. Um, because not only did I have garbage mental health and I probably maybe shouldn't have gone out in the first place because it was <laughs> so bad, but God needed me there. And so he made it happen, but I had garbage mental health and then COVID hit and they were sending home missionaries with mental health problems because they were worried they wouldn't be able to handle quarantine. Right. And then I made it through that too. And then like my entire mission, like so many things happened that should have sent me home, but I knew that I had received that promise and I just had faith that God would keep me here if he needed me here. And I did. I served the full 18 months and I'm so grateful for every minute that I had. And had I served a shorter mission, that would have been my full mission. And if missionaries have to go home in order to do the healing that I was able to accomplish on the mission, that's okay. Go Being able to heal is so important. And yeah, absolutely. I needed some really radical circumstances to force me to do that healing. (laughs) And I think I needed the pressure of the mission of just that fast pace. Like you're constantly focused on Christ and constantly growing. I needed that. And other people Mm -hmm. don't need that. They need to be home and they need to be feeling safe. Mm -hmm. But man, God knew me so well. He knew that I would love every minute of my mission. I loved teaching all over Facebook. I loved being inside my house. (laughs) Yeah. I'm actually like a total homebody. I'm like a, I'm like a little gremlin. I love staying home. <laughs> um, and I loved all my companions, every single one of them. And like during the hard times, during the good times, they were wonderful. Mm-hmm. So, what, so what advice would you give to somebody that's struggling with this, but their parents are oblivious like we were, that everything was fine? How, like now looking back... Do you have any advice or anything that you could say that could help people that might be feeling this way to be able to talk to somebody or? I'd probably say first that you are not irredeemable. There is not one person in this world that's irredeemable because God did not make us to only grow so much. He, we are all eternal beings. God made us to become gods. So we all have that inside of us. We're not meant to like reach this limit and be like, that's only as far as you're supposed to reach. That's, that's as high as you grow. We're all meant to overcome everything, but not by ourselves because we are weak. (laughs) We're meant to overcome it with Christ. And when you can't feel the spirit and when life is just beating you down and you don't feel like you're worth anything and you don't feel like you're worth talking to God or you're worth Mm -hmm. having Christ help you. Just know that that is exactly what Satan would say if he was sitting right next to you. If God is the one person that can heal you, he's the one person that Satan's going to try to keep you from as much as possible. So yeah. punch him straight in the face, punch Satan in the <laughs> face, and go and reach out to somebody. If you don't feel like you can pray right now, at least try something. Try opening your scriptures. God speaks a lot through the scriptures. Or talk to someone that you trust and tell them what's going on, at least a little bit, and say, hey, I'm really struggling and I feel like I need to talk to somebody. Are you free? If you really need to, um, there's lots and lots of ha- like hotlines and helplines. And the church mm-hmm. has this fantastic like, list of them. Uh, there's like a suicide and mental health like section of the website we will also put in the description because I help y'all make this thing. I could put as many yeah. things in the description <laughs> as I want. <laughs> it'll be a very long description but it'll be very good <laughs> yes full of things and even the fact that you're listening to this right now and you've made it this far in the podcast is a sign that 
like you want like you want help and you are willing to reach out like god knows your heart Mm -hmm. he knows how you're hurting he understands how hard it is to be able to even breathe and to function Mm -hmm. but people are more loving than maybe we give them credit for yeah and if you're afraid you'll drive someone away um i mean honestly it the people that I thought I would scare away the most, it's brought me closer than ever. And you can heal. It is not impossible. And I know it feels so impossible, so completely impossible, but it is. You can heal from this and you can be whole and you can be happy and you can feel joy. And then the best part comes because once you get to that point, even before you get to that point, even as you're moving forward, which feels so good, by the way, to move forward finally, um, (laughs) You bring other people with you. I can't tell you how many people I've met that I can tell God put me right in this spot because I understood what they were going through. Like the struggling Mm -hmm. that I had to go through for all of those years, I'm grateful for every minute of it, which sounds crazy because there was awful minutes of it. Yeah. Um, But because it, it grew my capacity, like the Lord took all of that pain. I don't think he caused it necessarily, but he took all of it and he turned it in for my good like the same christ who turned water into wine turned all of my pain into blessings like my capacity to speak to people my capacity to teach my capacity to grow and to learn and to reach out and to have empathy and understanding and to listen and to endure and to feel joy is just a thousandfold than what it used to be i am more i live life more full than i ever have and mm-hmm. I am grateful for my anxiety, which sounds so crazy. I'm grateful for my trials. Not that I need more, but. Like, <laughs> not an invitation. <laughs> not an invitation. <laughs> um, but more that I've, I have full confidence now that I'm going to go through a lot of painful things in this life that I haven't, I can't even imagine right now. But I know yeah. firsthand that God can take them and work them for my good. Mm-hmm. So I have a question. Do you have, sorry, do you have anything like any plans in place for if something happens and you plummet again, whether it's with your anxiety or with like a traumatic event that might happen? Like, do you have people that you've already talked to that you've been like, Hey, I need you to check in on me or Hey, you know, like, I'm going to go, I'm going to talk to this person if I'm struggling with something, or I'm going to reach out to that person. Do you, did you do anything like that? I think that would be a really good idea. I have been really stable, which stable is a great thing, by the way, living my best life, but I have been really stable for about two years now. Um, and I honestly, I don't, I don't think I've been asked to come up with a plan like that, but I know for sure that I, I live my life trying very hard to listen to myself if that makes sense like mm-hmm. I just like, however I'm feeling I accept how I'm feeling and then I do something about it like I process I take some time to think and process it I talk to somebody I reach out now so I'm sure if I was struggling with something like that I would first reach out to my mom my mom is my best friend yeah. and I would 100% get some help I just helped my brother sign up with a therapist and so now I'm really intimate with the process of how to get one not through a mission president so I would 100% talk to a therapist again if I felt like I needed it. Even if I wasn't like crazy deep struggling. If I was struggling, I'm like, wow, I really need some help. I'm just going to get some Mm -hmm. help. It's not so bad. I'd rather get some help than just struggle unnecessarily. Yeah. Yeah. I went to a therapist for the first time a couple years ago and it was amazing. Like like all of a sudden I didn't feel like I was such a crazy person anymore. And I, we keep using that word, right? But it's like, you really are, you internalize everything and you give everything so much meaning. And, and then it gets so heavy that you don't know what to do with it all. And you're afraid that if you, you know, open your mouth and give it to somebody, especially I think, yeah, like you just think that they're just going to be like, that's too much. I can't handle that. And they're going to just back away and then you're going to have nobody. And, um, And so it really helped just to like organize my thoughts. Like I was able to compartmentalize and to be able to kind of be like, oh, okay. And I love what you said earlier. You talked about how 
when you finally understood why you were thinking and feeling the way that you were thinking and feeling, you then, it's not that like it all stopped, but all of a sudden it was like, oh, this is, this is just what my brain does. It's okay. This is how my body was designed. That's what something I learned through therapy through some of my stuff that I had to go through was just that Heavenly Father created our brains in such a perfect way, right? That every little piece of our brain has a purpose. And when one thing is not getting the attention that it needs, the other parts of the brain kind of are like, hey, hold on a second. You know, like it, it's, it's, it's really something that I honestly believe when we talk about um, furthering our education in the church, I know a lot of people get so bent up on formal education, but our heavenly father, in order for us to have complete control of our bodies and our minds and our hearts and our spirits, we have to know how all of those things function. And we have to know why they function that way, you know, and we have to, we, I mean, guys, granted, most of us will never be like brain surgeons or heart surgeons or anything like that. But just even just the basic knowledge gives you so much power to heal. And one of the things that I recognized that I I picked up on you saying too, was that when you go through that stuff and you find a way to heal and, and it's not like you're always going to have some type of healing, right? Like you're never completely done. Like there's always going to be a little more that you can do, but all of a sudden I feel for me anyway, and, and maybe this is for you too. I'm able to recognize that pain that I endured in other people quicker. Like they don't even have to say or do anything in particular. It's almost like this spiritual string pulls me towards them. And I know that was a big thing that happened when I was in young women's, you know, some of the things that I struggled with as a child, a bunch of the other young women struggled with too. And I feel like I was in this unique position to be able to see and recognize that really, really quickly. And then it, then I became a safe space for them to talk to me about what was going on, you know, and to be able to give them some guidance and stuff. So when I realized that it was kind of like that full circle thing, you know, it was like, Oh, I, I see what you did there. Heavenly father. I get it. Okay. We'll do it again. If I have to, you know, if I have to go through something else so that it can come full circle and I can help someone else out in the future, you know, go ahead and use me. Not that I really want to, but you know, if I have to, that's okay. (laughs) Like I'll, I'll take it. So I think that was awesome that you, you just had that perspective i do want to say um since she's been home she's i do feel like she's in touch with her emotions a lot more she vocalizes it a lot more um she will she'll pull herself out of certain situations and take some some me time and some downtime when she's feeling feeling that anxiety so i think yeah, that's just knowing yourself, I think, helps a lot. Right, Clarissa? Yeah, definitely. And I really love how you said, Alicia, like, things are happening for a reason. Because obviously, one of the lies Satan told me was like, this is, there's, oh, what did he, not what did he say. Not <laughs> um, but it's just, I thought that all of this was happening for absolutely no reason. There was nothing I could do about it, right? Like, mm-hmm. I just feel like this all the time. And that's just how it is. So I just have to handle it better. Um, that is not it. I Sometimes no. it, you just have to take yourself out of a situation. Sometimes you're tired and you need a nap. Or mm-hmm. I find that most of the time I found out my anxiety is just because I'm overwhelmed and I just need to process things. So I'll take a drive. I'll just go and I'll, I, I do this thing where I just pray out loud and it's just complete rambling nonsense. Or sometimes I'll even sing it if I'm feeling real weird. Um, But it's just, it doesn't matter how well you say it. God just wants to hear you. And then even being able to hear yourself and just understand like, oh, this isn't actually as big as I thought it was. I'm okay. Like, this is going to be fine. It's, Satan is really good at blowing things out of proportion. Yeah, he is. 
I laughed a little bit when you talked about, you know, just hearing yourself because <laughs> I just realized, and I still do this. I'm still like, I'm sorry. I have like a hair, but I, um, as a kid, especially, right. Like I remember literally standing and talking to myself in the mirror all the time. And I would have these arguments where I no, I'm not even joking. I would have these arguments with myself, you know, and, and, and I would like, then I would start practicing as I got older and I started realizing that, like, man, I really love public speaking. I would like stand in the bathroom and I'd be like doing my hair and then putting on my makeup and stuff. And I'd be like giving a whole motivational speech. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> and I still do it. I will talk, I will turn the radio down in the car and I'll be driving to work and I'll just like go off rambling about something that's been going on and how I'm going to fix it. And I don't know, <laughs> but it, it, it helps. helps so much. Yeah. It helps to get it all out and be like, Oh, okay. This isn't really like right. as big as I thought it was <laughs> when it, when it's inside your head, it's huge. And the second you mm-hmm. it like comes out, you're like, Oh, this was, <laughs> this was causing you so much problems. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. Exactly. You know, I, I remember telling the youth, and I think I've shared this on another podcast at some point, that that Satan really does, like, thrive in secrecy. You know, he grows so strong. The more silent you are, the stronger he gets. And so even if even if you have to put it in a journal or you have to just speak it out loud to yourself, anything to get it out, first and foremost, like will help you so, so much. Ultimately, you know, we really should, I think, bring it to another person. I think that's why we're here on this earth, right? Like to connect, like we're all spiritual family. And I do think that there's, there's power in connection, you know, and in sharing our stories. That's one thing that Scott and I heard over and over during this book conference this week, this past weekend was just you know, share your story. There's strength in sharing your story, not just for you, but for other people too. And your story doesn't have to have an ending. You can be in the very first few chapters of your story and you can share it with someone and it can still give them strength and it can give you strength and it, you know, it can have a purpose in it. So, um, anyway, I'm rambling. Sorry. (laughs) So one of, one of, um, one of my mentors is Tony Robbins. He's a motivational speaker, Mm -hmm. but I remember, him talking about changing your state and Mm. if you want to if if you want to change your your the way that you're thinking about something change your state go and do something different do jumping jacks go and give yourself a a speech in the mirror go you know (laughs) do something different than just than the then that's that down state that you're in he tells a story of this one lady that he, she came up to him. She was crying about how bad her life was. And he had a cup of water and she's like crying and, and saying how bad her life is. And he's poured the water on her, on her face. Oh, <laughs> and, and she's, and he did it so he could change her state. Right. And uh, just get her out of that, that downward spiral. I, mm-hmm. I just always thought that was like the funniest story, but I think that's important too, is, you know, if you are in that, in that negative thought pattern, do something to get yourself out of it. If you can. Yeah. I think that helps. Well, Scott, let me ask you, I mean, having, when, well, when did you first find out about the struggle that Clarissa was having? Was it on her mission or was it after she came home or? I mean, I knew she had some anxiety beforehand but I didn't know it was to the level that it was and I mean if I would have known it was to it was that bad we probably would have had you know had her go to Mm -hmm. therapy and stuff beforehand but um I think maybe even part of that was her own self-talk thinking oh it's not as bad as as right you know it really is um some self-justification there but yeah, I mean, the cool thing is, is that she got, she got that help and she was able to figure out a lot of things, a lot of coping mechanisms that have really helped her. Mm-hmm. So she, what? and she sticks to it. Nice. And I know she mentioned that, you know, moms, right? Like 
moms, we can talk to our kiddos a lot. And, um, and so she's, she's got Darla. That's kind of like her first go-to what I guess I'm going to ask you from a, from a father's perspective. Um, do you, are you able to like have any check-ins with her? You know, like, do you have anything that you can do or that you've learned that you can do to kind of help her along to keep her on this, you know, good progressive path? Well, for one, she has to say that her mom is her favorite because she's on podcast, <laughs> but we all know who her real favorite is. Me. You're right. Yes. And, then I'm, and then I'm next. And then Neither her mom. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, hmm. but yeah, Dar- uh, Clarissa and I have, have good talks and okay. I think it's a lot different than it used to be. She opens yeah. up a lot more and. And that's helped our relationship too. That's awesome. But it also makes me more aware um, for my young, my younger kids. That's but, awesome. Yeah, there's still probably more that I can do there too. So we all, well, we all we're all on this journey, yeah. right? Yeah, I know. One of the things that I did um, during the summer months when we were kind of dealing with everything with my own kiddo was, um, I took this this health and um, mental health and safety class. And one of the things that they told us was don't be afraid to ask the really hard questions that feel very scary. And, and one of them that totally shocked me, um, was especially if you're dealing with someone who does have suicidal thoughts, right. Or who might have, even if you don't know, right. Even if they seem totally fine, they said, don't be afraid to ask directly, And I know this is going to sound very harsh, what I'm going to say, but um, ask them, don't say, have you had thoughts of hurting yourself? But instead, you need to actually say, have you had any thoughts about killing yourself? Have you had any thoughts about ending your life? You have to be very, very direct and very, very blunt in that because a lot of the times when they're in those states of considering self-harm or suicide, um, if you say something like, have you thought about hurting yourself? In their mind, they believe that committing suicide ends the pain. So they don't believe that they're going to hurt themselves. They believe they're going to stop the hurt. And so it's, it's really, really like, I highly suggest any parent anywhere, whether you think your child's going through some type of anxiety or not, um, to go and do what you can to research mental health and how to talk to your teens and, and your younger children, um, we unfortunately just had a friend of my oldest kids, um, who he, he did, he committed suicide about a month ago, almost exactly a month ago. And, um, nobody knew, nobody had any idea. He was, he was this amazing sports kid. He had a great family, you know, they were really, um, just active and happy and they had fun and he had all this support and he grew up in this town and, And it was, it was honestly, it was such a shock. Like he had so much going for him and nobody had any idea that he was struggling with mental health at all until it was too late. And it's, as a parent, I can tell you for anyone who's listening, like, don't, don't be afraid that you're going to put the idea in their head, because I promise if the idea is, if the idea is in their head or it's going to be in their head, it's already there. Like they've, you know what I mean? Like I would rather have my kid feel awkward for a moment. You know what I mean? And, and be able to live. And if that means that I have to get uncomfortable and I have to bring up the hard conversations and I have to, you know, do all the research and stuff. Like I, I would so much rather deal with the consequences of that than the consequences of asking myself, dang, what if I had just, said something or done something, you know, cause it's, it's just so hard. It, parenting is so hard anyway. And then when you throw any type of mental health into the mix, it's, um, it feels a little overwhelming, right. But there are so many resources out there that can help us as parents, as, as siblings, as friends, you know, spouses, wherever you are, like it's, it's really important to connect with people and to check in on them, you know? All right, Claire, so do you have any last thoughts or anything else you'd like to share? I'm just so grateful 
I am so grateful that I've been able to, no, I'm so grateful that the Lord has shown me where he's been my whole life because he was with me every single minute. And I, I once had this experience that I'll share really briefly, but I had this experience where I was biking in the dark once. Um, through a really sketchy part of neighborhood lined with homeless camps and I probably shouldn't have been there but I was trying to get to safety and I had a bike light that was I should have plugged in the night before but I didn't and it was nearly dead and I could only see exactly like a foot ahead of my bike pure darkness all around with literally homeless people hiding in the darkness like I knew 100% sure they were there also a lot of people died on on that path anyway um I was biking uh to get home and I prayed so hard prayed so hard that the Lord would keep me safe and he did but I had to trust him that he would get me there like if I stopped and I got off because I was so scared then I never would have gotten home and I would have been in more danger I had to keep going forward even though I couldn't see where the path was going all I could see was if it was turning left it was turning right or it was going down a little bit or up a little bit that's all I could see I didn't know how far we were going down I didn't know how far in any direction but I just trusted that if I stayed on this path, I would get home safe. And I did. And I find that, at least with the Lord, that's how he teaches me a lot. He only gives me this much, just one more step. And I have absolutely no idea where we're going. (laughs) But I trust him that he will one day lead me to safety. And I found that when I prayed initially, and and I asked him to save my life, and he did, but didn't heal me, that was step one. And then the step two was learning how to talk nice, kinder to myself. And then I had to learn how to help others and reach out of myself and grow and learn. It was a hundred little teeny tiny steps. But after hundreds and hundreds of those, I did reach safety. I did reach light. And I know that no matter how dark it is right now, as long as you just take that next good step, it doesn't have to be the very best step in the world, just a good step in the right direction. It's kind of like, when um, my dad and I would walk in the snow when I was really little, I just had to step in his footprint and just the very next one and eventually we got out of the snow. And I know that no matter how painful it is right now, taking the next step is always the right option. Don't ever stop. Don't give up because you're, it's just, you're just going to get colder. And I promise that you have the capacity to feel joy again. And that one day you will be healed and it's worth it because there's lots of people out there waiting for you to help them in their journey. I love that. Nice. Clarissa, thank you so much for coming on and for sharing such a personal story and for really just being that person that you know, changes lives. Cause you do you've, I'm so glad that you took all the, those little steps because you have been such a positive force for good in my own life. Um, I smile just every time I think about you, you just, you radiate love and, um, an inspiration and motivation and you come from good parents. (laughs) You have some good parents who really helped you out. And, and I just, I love, I love your whole family and, and I'm so thankful that you came on today. So thank you. Yeah. I'm glad you're my kid. (laughs) Oh, wow. All right. Well, thank you, Clarissa. And thank you, all our listeners, for tuning in and listening to Clarissa's story. Um, One of the best ways that you can share it is to take five seconds, go to Facebook, and click that share button. Um, I'm I'm kind of coining the phrase five-second missionary work. Um, Because really, that's what it is. But really, you can in five seconds, you can affect hundreds of people and do some amazing missionary work. So go click that share button. Let's get this message out there. And and hopefully we can help someone that's struggling with depression or, you know, feelings of suicide or, you know, uh, Mm self-worth. Let's let's get that message out there and maybe we can help them. Absolutely. And remember, guys, we are always looking for new guests. We are looking for those who are willing to share their story. It's not as scary as you might originally think it is. Clarissa will attest to that. (laughs) Um, 
So if you guys have a story to share, if you know someone who would be a great guest on this podcast, please, please, please let us know. You can head over to latterdaylights.com or you can message us on Facebook. Um, We would love to hear your story and just to see how much it could inspire other people to share their light as well. So until next time, guys, we will see you on Sunday. Good night.